This morning, we are in the book of Haggai, chapter 2, verses 10 through 23. Now, Haggai uh, 2.10 begins one message, and then Haggai 2.20 begins a second message. So we're actually going to do a, a double header tonight. We'll be done about one. Well, we might be a little earlier, but anyway, we're going to do a double header to work through uh, two of these uh, final sermons or prophetic utterances that Haggai gave, both of which were given on the same day. So it was kind of like the, the morning and the afternoon or something like that. So buckle up. The genius behind the Suez Canal was a man by the name of Ferdinand de Lesseps. The Suez Canal was completed in 1869, and this was a, a miracle. I mean, it was stunning. You could actually take a boat from the Mediterranean and go to the Red Sea, and you did not have to go all the way around Africa. And so Ferdinand de Lesseps was really viewed as the Elon Musk of his era. I mean, this, this guy's amazing. I mean, whatever he does, it just works. And everyone wanted to, to be involved in his next amazing project, which was a canal that is going to cross Panama, which he attempted in the 1880s. Now, he was convinced that it would be a pathway between the seas in which you didn't have any locks or anything. It was really just going to be a, a boats can just drive both ways without any having to be elevated or anything. And he was convinced, and that's true of the Suez Canal because it's basically flat, that wasn't going to work in Panama. In fact, there's some places where it's, it's almost physically impossible to create the canal at sea level because of the amount of mountain that is there that the erosion would make it to where it, it's just not going to work. But he was successful in his first project and everybody believed he can do this. He was convinced it had to be sea level and all of his engineers, he was not an engineer, but his engineers talked to him and said, there, here's reasons why this cannot be done. No, no, it has to be done this way. His previous success set him up for failure. Success, failure, where, did, where does that come from? Listen to this. This is what God said to Joshua. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may have success wherever you go. He's saying, if you want to be successful, you need me to be in the center. You need to live a life that's honoring and pleasing me. He goes on, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. And then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. You will be successful if you live in a way in which I'm in the center. Well, what if we blow it? I mean... You know, there are times when I, I don't live with God in the center. I mess up. Does that mean I'm not going to succeed? I'm, I'm doomed to fail? My answer is yes. <laughs> if you're not living with God in the center, we are doomed to failure. But there is a secret that a few understand that makes it possible, and get this, for those who have reaped failure for disobeying God to actually experience unbelievable success. And I'm going to explain that to you this morning because it's in the message that we're going to read. So starting in uh, chapter 2, here we go. On the 24th of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priest for a ruling. If a man carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches bread with his fold or cooked food, wine, oil, or any other food, will it become holy? And the priest answered, no. Then Haggai said, now if one who is unclean from a corpse touches any of these, will the latter become unclean? And the priest answered, it will become unclean. Then Haggai said, so is this people. 
And so is this nation before me, declares the Lord. And so is every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. But now, do consider from this day onward, before one stone was placed on another in the temple of the Lord, from that time when one came to a grain heap of 20 measures, there would be only 10. And when one came to the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there would be only 20. I smote you in every work of your hands with blasting wind, mildew, and hail. Yet you did not come back to me, declares the Lord. Do consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day when the temple of the Lord was founded, consider, is the seed still in the barn? Even including the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree, it has not borne fruit. Yet from this day, I will bless you. May God bless the reading of his word. We're going to unpack something in here that to me is stunning. And it relates to us as well as to them. So the date of this message, and again, we're doing a double, so this first message that begins in chapter 2, verse 10 and 9, um, is December 18, 520 B.C. So we actually know the date. It's almost four months after the first message that was given. There's a double header in chapter 1. Zechariah, who is a contemporary of Haggai, has actually begun his ministry. Uh, the last three books of the Old Testament, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. So Zechariah was also around at this time. And his message, this is from Zechariah 1, he says, return to me that I may return to you. So he's saying basically, come back to me and I will come to you. So Zechariah is echoing and reinforcing what Haggai said in the first message, which we did a few weeks ago, which is the first two messages in chapter 1. Now, at this particular date in December, the winter crops are complete. The early rain has fallen. And the previous harvest for the last 14 years have been disappointing. Yields have been dramatically below projections based on seed volume. I mean, we plant seed that should have yielded this, and instead we yield half of what we thought, or a third of what we thought. So it's not been good. Weather events have produced a lot of additional havoc. And there's no reason for them to think that it's going to get any better. I mean, nothing is different. Now, God said, I am with you. In response to them beginning the temple, he said, I'm with you. And the work is progressing. They've been at it for a couple months now. But the farming conditions and the crop yields of the last 14 years, which were intended to help Israel connect the dots, and there was this lack, this shortage, they should have been able to use Deuteronomy 28 and say, when this happens, we know, because we were told by Moses, who was speaking for God, when this happens, it's because your heart's not in the right place. So that's what you need to deal with. So the farming conditions, the crop yields of the last 14 years should have helped them connect the dots. There's something not right, but it, it didn't. Israel had a cupcake problem, and I want to explain that to you. So I've got a couple cupcake friends, so come on up. It's time. <laughs> Yeah, I've told them they can have some cupcakes, and you can actually take the cupcakes back if you want to. You can come right here so you can see what you want. So anyway, um, here's a plate for each of you, and if you would, pick a cupcake that you really like. Put it on the plate. Very good. And do you want sprinkles? Sprinkles? Okay. Very good. Here we go. All right. Now, this sprinkle stuff is pretty expensive. So I thought, well, I could save some money. So I went out in the parking lot and got some, some gravel. So, okay, um, there you go. How do those look to you? You want those? Not, not feeling it? Uh, you didn't want gravel sprinkles. You wanted good sprinkles. So if I put good sprinkles on there, okay, let's do that. There you go. All right, you ready? You want those cupcakes? <laughs> no, because bad sprinkles ruined a perfectly good cupcake, right? Now, the cupcake is still the same, right? It hasn't changed, but the bad stuff on it has made it to where it's ruined the whole thing, hasn't it? 
That's like sin. Even when I try to do something good, but I tell a lie, or I'm rude, or I'm unkind, or not thoughtful, that ruins it, just like dirt and gravel sprinkles ruin a perfectly good cupcake. So what you really need, well, first let's do this. Go ahead and take your cupcake and pull it, wrap it up, and then you can put it in the trash right there, because that's where a bad cupcake needs to go, is in the trash, right? Now, you may each pick a cupcake, and I'm giving you a new cupcake, right? Would you like sprinkles, the real kind, not gravel sprinkles? You need to tell me that, not gravel sprinkles. Okay, all right, well, you may each put sprinkles on, and you may go ahead and get your cupcake properly sprinkified. Very good. And you may take those good cupcakes back to your seat and you may actually eat them during the sermon as long as mom's okay with that, okay? All right. When sin is sprinkled on our lives, it makes it not work, no good. It ruins it. Sin can do damage to a relationship, and it gives others reason to view God unfavorably. Nobody wants our cupcake if it's got the gravel sprinkles on it, and that's what's going on with Israel. Sin, which in their case consisted of two things. One, they were more afraid of people than they were of God. That's why they didn't build. They were so fearful. Ah, oh, if we start doing this, everybody's gonna jump on our case. That was one reason. And the other was, we need to take care of us, and we'll take care of God when we've got us taken care of. Now, all of that was in chapter one, where we talked about that. That was was their sprinkles. And basically, what that meant is, everything you touch has sprinkles on it, gravel sprinkles, it's corrupted. 14 years of messed up priorities have made the work of Israel's hands toxic. Every seed you touch, every ground you till, you're you're just putting gravel sprinkles on it because you have been a people who are afraid of everybody else and don't have a fear for me. You think your life is more important than God's and therefore everything you touch is messed up. So in Haggai's message, let me show you how that connects to what Haggai is saying. Haggai's message has some Q&A. He gets the, the priests, who are kind of the Bible answer men, and he says, does holiness go from A to B to C? In other words, when you do something holy and you are involved with this, and then that is involved with the next, does holiness go from A to C? And you're saying, what does that have to do with anything? Hang on. And then he asked them, what about sin? Does sin go from A to B to C? And their answer is yes. In other words, sin has a higher toxicity than holiness. Here's why that matters. Basically, this is a people, their priorities were wrong. And so everything they touch is corrupted. It's got gravel sprinkles on it, everything they touch. But then they turned around a few months before and they said, okay, we will do what is right and we will honor God and so we're going to engage in the work of the temple. But the temple is not gonna make the ground better. Basically what he's saying is yes, you are going to do a good thing by working on the temple. But the fact that the temple is on the ground does not mean that it's going to make everything in the crops go right. You are going to still live with the consequences of your actions. You've ruined the ground. Just like a perfectly good cupcake that's been ruined with gravel. That's what you've done. Does unholiness go from A to B to C? Yes, it does. So you have been touching the ground and everything associated with it. There are consequences. Here's what he said. So is this people. 
And so is this nation before me, declares the Lord. And so is every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. In other words, you by what you did put dirt sprinkles on everything. Messed it up. Now, in the analogy that he was asking the, the priest to address, the, the C in the equation was food. Cooked food, wine, oil, any other food. Uh, it, that included the basics, which are seeds, grapes, olives, and luxury food, which is figs and pomegranates. They're all specifically mentioned. And, you know, and he says, you've started work on the temple, but by all rights, that's not going to change the fact that the ground is a consequence, its fertility is a consequence of your having been disobedient. Evil is highly contagious. Sin is wicked stuff. Good sprinkles cannot redeem a bad cupcake, but bad sprinkles can contaminate a good cupcake. That's basically what God's saying. One man's good example can't save somebody else. But one man's inf evil influence can negatively impact somebody else. But here's the thing. God is going to do something truly remarkable. I mean, it, it's stunning. God says, let's compare, bookend the last 14 years between today's date and the date when the temple foundation was f first laid, your grain yields were down 50% from what they should be. Your vine yields were down 60%. Weird weather patterns, wind, mildew, hail. But I want you to make a mental note. I want you to mark this down. I don't know if they had calendars. They certainly didn't have an iPhone. I want you to mark down this date on your calendar, December 18, 520 B.C. And God, through the prophet, says, write this down, December 18, 520 B.C. Why? I am going to bless you. I am going to bring good upon you from this date forward. You've ruined a bunch of stuff. I'm going to rescue you from the consequences of your disobedience. Now, at this moment, this is a pretty bold prediction. You know, it's not like they've seen, you know, you know, I, I, I don't know what it is, but I've seen things sprouting and it's coming up. None of that has happened yet. There's absolutely nothing to suggest that they are about to see something unbelievable except God saying, mark this date, I'm going to bless you. Going forward, that's what's going to happen. Yes, the, five, the 519 B.C. crop yields are going to be off the chart even though the 520 B.C. was not. And... It's B.C., so the numbers go down. The winter crop planting has been completed. The early rains have fallen. You have no reason to expect anything different from the last 14 years, except here's the one thing that is the difference maker. I'm going to be your difference maker. And I'm going to release you from your consequences. You, by right of what you have done, have made the land into non-productive because you've not honored me. But I am going to release you from those consequences. This is God's way of saying, welcome to the world of grace. Grace is in the Old Testament? I thought that's about law. Oh, no, there's tons of places where grace shows up, and this is one of them. God is saying, if you get what you deserve, it would be a continuance of living hard stuff. That's what you deserve. But you have chosen to say, no, we will stop fearing the other people. We will put God in the center. And he's saying, and I am going to bless, bless you. And I am going to show you grace because of your decision. When we do something good today, that doesn't automatically erase the consequences from past failures. You know, I can... I can I do something yesterday that was really stupid or really wrong, and then I do something today, they don't cancel each other out. There may well be consequences from past failures that I am still living with. But get this, this is stunning. It pleases God. He, he actually wants to do this, to give us grace, to release us from the consequences of past failures simply because he is good 
He can and does defy the law of dirt sprinkles and he says, let me give you something new. When you get your heart right with God, which we know is accomplished when you come to the foot of the cross, it pleases him to give you grace. And if you have come to the cross and you're doing something that is dishonoring to God, it pleases him when you come to him and you acknowledge what you've done, it pleases him to say, I'm going to give you grace. And I'm going to deliver you from the consequences of what you have done. So here's my question for you. Are you currently living with consequences from a bad choice or bad choices? Is there something that you have done to hurt people around you? And now you're living with the consequences of that? I realize this is a question that's close to home, but we need to ask it. Because if we will come before the Lord and acknowledge, God, I have done this, it pleases him to show us grace. And he may well indeed restore the lean years and help us. So how do we do this, Jim? Admit that the consequences you're facing are the product of your wrong choices. Now, not all hard things are a product of wrong choices, so I have to acknowledge that. But it's possible that you're facing a hard thing because of choices you've made. Recognize that and just say, God, I realize that had I not done this, I would not be realizing this. And confess to him, God, my priorities have not been right. Then ask God, ask him this, God, would you please show me grace and release me from those consequences? Not because I deserve it, I don't, but simply because I know you to be a God of grace. I do? Yes, you do. Because when Jesus was on the cross, he was there in your place, in my place. Because he wanted to give the greatest gift of all time, salvation, to a people who by all rights should reap the dirt-laden cupcake that they've sown. Even while he's on the cross, you know what he's saying? Here's a bunch of guys who are, they've nailed him to this cross. They're gambling over his clothes, oblivious. And he says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. That's what Jesus did on the cross. Not just for them, for us. As a bold, irrefutable declaration, I want to give grace to those who will come to the foot of the cross and say, I deserve what I have sown. But I'm pleading with you for grace. And he says, Father, forgive them. And he says, and I am going to bless you. Well, that's the first message. Let me show you the second, all right? So this is in Haggai chapter 2, starting with first, I think it's 19 or 20. Um, Let's recap a little bit. A remnant has returned to Jerusalem, but encountered, oh, opposition I mean, the people first said, hey, let us help you. And we talked about this a few weeks ago. Hey, let us help you. But these are people who were not honoring to God. And they didn't want them to mess it up. So they said, no. So those people turned. Instead of saying, hey, we'll help you, they said, we're going to do everything we can to oppose you, to make your life difficult. And so there was fear. Man, we don't don't want to embark on this project. Uh, And also... We need to take care of us. I mean, we've just come back to, you know, the remnant of a war zone. There's nothing here. We gotta, we gotta take care of, I gotta take care of me. And, and then we can take care of God's stuff. But I'll, I'll do me first. That's what they did. Their personal interest displaced devotion to God. And so God spoke to them through Haggai 16 years after the return. 14 years after they started and stopped the building of the temple. And he said, consider your ways. I want you to connect the dots. And the result was that the people reverenced God and began again to work on the temple. So in 
Message one, here's what God says. They start working on the temple. I am with you. I'm going to partner with you in the building of the temple. And then the Lord stirred up the spirit of the leaders and the people. So once again, God said to them in message response number three, I am with you. We're going to partner together. Then in the message we just looked at, he says, from this day on, from this date in December, I am going to release you from the consequences of your actions. I'm going to bless you. And now the last message that he's going to give is, my good plan for you is on track. We're going to get back to where we were going. And that's what he's going to tell us in this message that starts in verse 20. Then the word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, saying, so on this same date, December 18, 520, here's a second message. The first one maybe is the morning, the next one is afternoon, something like that. It's kind of like Sunday morning, Sunday evening sermon. Two messages in one day, which is similar to what happened on day one, which we considered in chapter one. But this is now almost four months later. But this message goes to an audience of one. Zerubbabel, who was the governor of Israel at the time, who was appointed by the uh, Persian uh, who allowed him to come back to this land. Zerubbabel is a son of Shealtiel and the grandson of Jeconiah, who's also known as Kaniah. And that might not mean anything to you except for the fact that God cursed Kaniah and said, I am not going to bring a Messiah through you. Here, I'm done with you. You're like a signet ring. I'm thrown away. And we'll see that in a minute. But God declares Zerubbabel, grandson or great grandson of Kaniah, I got a plan for you. Let me tell you what I'm going to do. This is in the future. It hasn't even happened yet in our time. So this is 2,500 years into the future or more. First off, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. Now, this is not just an earthquake. He doesn't say, I'm going to shake the earth. I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. This is coming. I don't know when it's coming, but it is coming, that there is going to be a complete shakeup of the universe. That's number one. And I will overthrow the thrones of kingdoms and destroy the power of the kingdoms of the nations. All political entities are going to be replaced. Every empire of man is going to come to its conclusion. This is a reference to when Jesus Christ returns to establish his messianic kingdom. He says, and I will overthrow the chariots and the riders. All military power will be neutralized, kind of like a, a neutron bomb that basically wipes out the uh, electronic capabilities of everything. I don't know how it works, but God's capable. And basically everything that all military is capable of doing, nothing. Nothing. And then he says, and the horses and the riders will go down, everyone by the sword of one another. This is kind of a mutually assured destruction, mad, in which they turn on one another. It's just total chaos. So here's God, through Haggai, saying to Zerubbabel, who is a great, 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 I don't know how many, grandson of David. And he's saying, I want to tell you something. Here's something that is going to happen in the future, far future. I am going to totally shake everything up. I am going to replace every kingdom. I'm going to overthrow all the implements of war. It's all going to be neutralized. Everybody's going to turn on one another. That's a part of what's coming. Really? Yeah. Many places in the Bible this is referred to. You remember the vision that Daniel had? Or the vision that Nebuchadnezzar had and then Daniel interpreted it? Here's what Daniel 2, 34 and 35 say. This is Daniel recounting to Nebuchadnezzar what his dream was. You continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold were crushed and all at the same time it became like chaff from the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. Not a trace. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. What, what's, what is this about? Glad you asked. So Daniel interpreted the vision a little bit later for Nebuchadnezzar. He said, let me explain what you've just seen. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. That's the kingdom that will be established when Jesus Christ returns. 
And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, in other words, this is not a kingdom created by men, it's created by God. It crushes the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, all of these empires of man. The great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future, so the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. Now this image that Nebuchadnezzar saw, that Daniel interpreted, had been revealed to Nebuchadnezzar about mm, maybe 60 years before, uh, maybe 50 years before Haggai is having this message. But what Haggai is saying to Zerubbabel is, I'm going to do what I told Daniel I'm going to do, which is I am going to replace the empire of man with the kingdom of Jesus. That's what's coming. And so this image with gold and silver, etc., is the empire of man, different phases of it. But in the end, when Jesus Christ returns, he's going to establish a kingdom that is a stone not made with hands, but it will grow to become something that is everything. Daniel's not the only one to talk about it. Here's Peter. Know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lust and saying, where's the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. There are gonna be tons of people who are saying, yeah, return of Jesus, yeah, right, like that's gonna happen. You guys are crazy, you're nuts. That's stupid. We all know that, you know, we all came from some primordial ooze and whatever. No, it's not stupid. It may be something that you have a tough time wrapping your mind around, but if God says it, which he has through his word, you can bank on it. This is where we're going. And God, get this, is going to hit the reset button. The empire of men will be replaced by the kingdom of Jesus. And all who are on Jesus' team... <laughs> We'll enjoy it forever, and those who oppose him, it won't end well. So here's what God is saying to Zerubbabel. He's saying, uh, you may feel like you are an insignificant people being dominated by powerful nations and influences, but you are the one people who, by right of their association with me, are gonna prevail where everybody else has fallen. In other words, what he's saying is, previous message from this day forward I'm going to bless you and number two stick with me it will be worth it we will prevail that's what he's saying on that day declares the Lord of hosts I will take you Zerubbabel son of Shealtah my servant declares the Lord and I will make you like a signet ring for I have chosen you declares the Lord of hosts uh, on that day what day the day when he establishes this empire it's Messiah Day, and he declares, he says, the word declare shows up three times. So he said it three times. I'm going to tell you three times. I'm going to take you, make you like a signet ring, and I'm going to choose you. To take means divine appointment. I've decided I want you, and to make you a signet ring means to make you someone who is valuable. Now he's talking about what's yet to come. He's saying, I'm going to do this for you. What's a signet ring? Let me just show you a couple places. Uh, here's from Esther 8.8. 8. Uh, Ahasuerus says, Now you write to the Jews as you see fit in the king's name and seal it with the king's signet ring. So a signet ring is a, a ring that he would use and it could be used to stamp uh, on a clay, on an order or something like that. And because it is the king's stamp, if you've got that piece of paper or scroll, whatever it is, it's as good as if the king is standing there, which meant that this ring was profoundly valuable. To say, I'm gonna make you like a signet ring is to saying you're gonna become someone who is profoundly precious to me. Here's another passage. This one's interesting because he's talking about his great-grandpa. As I live, declares the Lord, even though Kaniah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were a signet ring on my right hand, yet I would pull you off. 
I'm done with you. And not long after that, Jerusalem fell at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. This is 60 or so years earlier. I will give you over into the hand of those who are seeking your life, yes, into the hand of those whom you dread, even into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of the Chaldeans, and all of that happened. God said, I'm taking you off. I'm done with you. And now he's saying to Zerubbabel, you're going to be like a signet ring to me. Whatever, this is what he's saying, whatever your grandfather did to forfeit his place of blessing, I am going to restore you to my favor. I am not going to make you incur the consequences of his failures. So it's kind of similar to the previous one. People, I am going to release you from the consequences of your sin. And now he's saying to this rebel, and I am going to release you from the consequences of what your grandpa did. You are valuable. You are precious to me. And I value you like a king does his signet ring. I have plans for you that go way beyond your current assignment. Yes, you're helping Israel build the temple. But let me tell you something. He didn't tell him this, but let me tell you something about who this guy is and what happened. Number one, if you look at the genealogy of Jesus, he's like the great, 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 and I don't know how many, about 10, I think, grandfather of Jesus. And he says, and I've got a special assignment for you when I come back to establish my kingdom. Yes, your great-grandson will be the Messiah. In the future, you will be someone who will be remembered as a regent and preview of the Messiah. And by the way, in the future, a resurrected Zerubbabel will occupy a position of special importance in the Messianic kingdom alongside my grandson, his, your grandson. In other words, there's a day yet future where he's gonna shake up the world. He's gonna replace all the empire of man and Jesus is gonna be on the throne and he's saying to, to Zerubbabel, and you will be my, like my signet ring. You will be precious to me. You are precious to me. And yeah, great grandpa really blew it. But I am going to show you grace and you are going to have a special place in the future with me. You know, God made a promise to David. This is quoted from Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord God, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. And God is telling Zerubbabel through Haggai, you're going to be a part of how I fulfill that promise because you are a son of David and Jesus will become a son of David. God is saying to Israel, your leader, Zerubbabel, he's a man who is valuable to me. And if you will partner with him in what you are doing and what I'm interested in, then I'm going to support it. Follow my man and you will do well. The kingdom which you're supporting by supporting Zerubbabel is the only earthly kingdom of all of human history that has a connection to the kingdom not made with hands. You're actually a part of something that is going to endure. And I would say to you, church... You are the only people on this planet, and when I talk to church, I'm talking to all those who know the name of Jesus. You are the only people on the planet who have a part of what is coming when Jesus returns. Talk about significance. Well, what, is this, what do I take away from this passage, Jim? What, what can I take away? Here's a people in a four-month period of time, and now I'm kind of capturing from the, all of these five messages who made a fresh start with God. God said to them, look at what's going on. Can you connect the dots? What you are experiencing is what someone would experience who's got their priorities messed up. Get them right, and they did. Sin makes a mess of everything it touches. It's like dirt sprinkles. But get this, this is key. Our sin cannot make a mess so bad that God's grace can't clean it up. It pleases God to give grace to those who will make a fresh start with him. This may be a fresh start where you've never started with Jesus, where you've never come to the cross and said, my life is a mess, there's dirt sprinkles everywhere. I need a savior, I need to be rescued from me. 
Or you may be someone who would name Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but there is some area, some domain, something in your life that is not honoring to him. If you will come before him, if you will say, God, I want to make a fresh start. I want to acknowledge what I've been doing and I can't do that anymore. I don't want to do that anymore. There is no mess that sin has created that is beyond God's ability to apply grace to those who will desire and who will commit themselves to make a fresh start with him. If you will choose to put God back in the center, he can supply what you lack to bring your decision to a successful conclusion. He can release you from consequences of poor choices. Now, it's not automatic. Hey, come to Jesus and everything will be fantastic. Sometimes God uses those consequences to get our attention and to teach us some things. I don't like this verse, but it basically says, tribulation produces endurance. Hard things are something that God uses sometimes to help me get to the right place. But the ultimate consequence, which is separation from God, his grace is capable of saying, that's what you deserve, but I'm going to give you something else. I'm going to name you as my son, my daughter. You belong to me. If we will make a fresh start with God, he can make of our efforts something of true significance, something of enduring value. That's what he's saying to them in Haggai. You guys are building a temple. You're not just building a temple. You're declaring who I am to a world that doesn't know. And you're a part of something that is going to endure for all eternity. So, what's your yes but? There is no way I can do what God is asking me right now because of what is in my history. I mean, Jim, if you know what I have done or whatever, I can't do this. I'm not worthy of this. Haggai shouts, put God back in the center and then watch what grace can do. God has done this for his servants. Here's Moses. God intervened in a way that's incredible. He was raised in Pharaoh's court. You know, he could well think, whoa, God has clearly prepared me to be a deliverer for Israel and he went out and murdered a man, fled, Became a shepherd 40 years. What a mess. But he met God at the burning bush and God says, no, no, I'm not done with you. David, man after God's heart, and yet he has an affair with someone else's wife and then murders the man. And Nathan the prophet comes to him and he tells a story. This is about a year later. He says, you're that man. And he's broken. And God applies grace to that history. Peter's standing at a fire in a courtyard and he locks eyes with Jesus right after he's done this. I don't know the man. He even swore about it. A few weeks later, Jesus met him on the bush around the campfire in the Sea of Galilee. And he says, Peter, I'm not done with you. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? He says, yes. Samson. Oh, so much wasted. Oh, so much wasted. But in the final moment, he says, God... And this is not his exact words, but I need a fresh start. And in the final act of his life, he honors God. The prodigal. What am I doing? He comes back. And the father in the story of the prodigal son is designed to give us a glimpse into our heavenly father's heart. And he welcomes him back and says, I've got a feast planned for you. That can be your story. I don't care where you are. I don't care what you've done. There is no mess so big that sin has created that grace can't.
can't be applied to it. And God wants to do that for everyone in this room. I long for us as a church to make a fresh start with God. I don't know exactly what that looks like. I long for you to make a fresh start with God in which you put the past behind you and you say, I want to live all in, all out for you, no matter what. And if we will come to him and acknowledge what we've done, He's faithful and he's just to forgive us our sin, cleanse us from all unrighteousness and work through us. And that's what I long for. So I'd like you to bow your heads if you would. Is there something that you are hearing that is the voice of recrimination? Oh, there's no way you can do this. If, if, if people around here knew... Maybe something you would say, I, I don't want anyone to know what's been going on on this front because I, I, I'm embarrassed by it. It's wrong. Pray with me. Father, I want to make a fresh start with you. I want to live all in all out for Jesus, who is my Savior. And I am acknowledging there are ways in which I have not done right by you, and it's made a mess. But I am coming before you humbly, and I'm acknowledging that, and I'm asking for you to pour out your grace on me because I want to make a fresh start with you in the center of all that I do. Thank you, Father, that we can actually come boldly to the throne of grace and plead for grace and mercy in time of need and to know that you give to all liberally who come to you pleading for grace. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who is our Savior. Amen.